we've got to find some progress for the delay technical problems with my Ubuntu box. Yeah, you can, you can laugh if you want them. Um, so my name is Michael. I work for Mismos, a um, small company in um, today in Berlin. We, we do all of the IT and software on this. Uh, we did not start for Nokia and the MIMO project. Now it comes to that. And we were more busy at night at the end of the So my experience is mostly from the at night of working on the input with the team. And what I want to do, what I want to do is to explain the problems that we face on the software. And what I think needs to be done to, to improve the current situation that we have. Because currently, with mobile text input, well, it's actually something we made up in our team. Mobile text input, what does it mean? Um, I will come to that later. But, but the current situation is that no one's really aware of all these problems, especially in the toolkits on the big, big projects, you know, for KDE. So there's little awareness of um, what it actually takes to get that right and how much polishing is required to get a decent input method if you really go to touch screens. If you want to do that, uh, if you want to do that way, there's a lot of work ahead of you. Anyways, um, mobile text input. Yeah, so what is it? First, first of all, the, the mobile devices become increasingly popular. And more and more of them. Um, they, they come without most of our traditional hardware keyboard, which um, for many of us is a problem. Um, it's, it's just because we got used so much to having a point pointer device that's actually accurate and to have hardware keyboard, which has real money for all that. And everything is um, designed for that, all, all of our applications, everything, all of our graphs are designed for that. So it's difficult to do. Just switch to, to, to that. And what I've seen with mobile devices, if you, if you, if you look at all the generations on the development where it's currently going, the first thing that they always try to do is I just copy, they just copy the, the metaphors of they, what they know from the desktop and try to put it one to one on a mobile device with actually horrible results. Um, if you had a Symbian, and you have the, the first the first virtual keyboard there, for example, where you're just um, switching into full screen mode, you would only see the virtual keyboard, you would have a text entry, where you can then do something, you press it down, and then submit the text to the application, and you can continue there. So whenever you want to enter something, even just a, a tiny small word, whatever you want to do, it's always a context switch. Because they just didn't know better. The, the whole the the idea was to, to, but to have a different method that just isn't at on. It's not really integrated with application. It just needs to work somehow. Just put it there and people accept it, whatever. Um, with with, with, uh, with uh, touch screens as as a replacement for, for the traditional hard keyboard and for the mouse. Basically, it combines both. Um, we have a lot of more difficult, actually. I already mentioned the, the accuracy problem of pointers. So the mouse pointer, we, we can position things very accurately, very quickly, most of us at least. Um, accessibility is another concern, but we're going to not go into that now. Um, And when you, go to, when, you go to the, when you go to the touch screen, then you try to do something accurate with your fingers, it will never work. Most, mostly because whenever you touch with your finger, your finger is covering where you touch. So try to do anything accurate with your fingers, the touch screen won't work. Unless it's maybe huge and the size of the finger doesn't matter. But most of us have big thumbs and we have this relatively small uh, space. And I mean, you probably have the experience just hitting keys on the virtual keyboards can be very, very annoying. So, 
what we experienced actually when, when we when we worked for Mayimo and Migo, and suddenly uh, the stuff was supposed to run on tablets. This is a surprising, but far surprising thing is, was okay. So you have this virtual keyboard, for, for example, for um, for the cancer. You take it one to one, you want to put it on a tablet. It doesn't feel nice. It doesn't work. Because what you need to do actually on, on the tablet again, you need to consider you now have a much bigger touch screen. And now what you what you maybe have here on the other hand side, you can use it with one hand. You can just navigate to the sun everywhere. You don't have that anymore on the tablet. Your you thumb doesn't reach very far. So you suddenly have two hands that you need to use. And then you have social keyboard somewhere in the center, maybe or whatever, and it doesn't work. So what you actually want to have maybe you want to have a different design. You want to have um, maybe a, a split virtual keyboard or what, where you, where you have just have the input on the sides that you can again easily use with results. So, so the text input um, follows these form factors in, in these mobile devices. So for each um, form factor, you, you probably have to rethink the, the, the sort of input as a problem, or you have to be um, actively. Uh, you need to actually detect and try to just copy one or something that was successful on one device and just copying to, to, to a different form factor when I'm not free. For the same reason that copying traditional input methods or traditional UIs from the desktop to the mobile space doesn't work. So, what I should mention maybe as well is. Um, Oh, let's go back. Why is it this different? Because uh, what's the relevance of for kind of devices? I mean, it's not just mobile devices. What, what I've seen when I, when I walk around, I, in the last few, few weeks, I actually, just where I went, in the underground or in the Democrat State Station or the whole reservation system here in, in, in Bristol, what I see is that uh, the special keyboards suddenly more, suddenly become more more common. You see them everywhere. And for the better device, that has, a, mm -hmm. that has a reason why my manufacturers choose to do so. They get rid of the keyboards, even though you might not, well, we might not be happy with that, um, but they take it away from us. First, they don't ask us what we want. They, they do what's cheap and reliable in that sense. They already have a touch screen, and then it's much, much easier to just have something, um, even a poor virtual keyboard or whatever, a poor input is there, and then they can get rid of a completely dedicated. Hard the keyboard, they don't even hand it. It's great, it's easy, it's cheaper. So, only the users are most often annoyed by these, by these uh, hard copy implementations because they don't find it They don't look nice, they don't feel nice, but again, they're maybe uh, only used for a very uh, specific use case, so not, not necessary to have high quality like other than the phone. Mm -hmm. phone they need to use that. In every application basically because that's not the mean if you have a hardware keyboard. Then um, then it's, uh, suddenly it starts to matter that your input method system, your text input solution is polished or not. If it's not, if it's, if it's slow, if it's un uh, not uh, accurate, if it crashes, you will you will realize that you will realize in every application. And so the, the downside of the downside of that implementation there is much higher on the headset than maybe what you have on that device. That's just one design use case. In my case, for example, there's an um, information point in the underground station where I just look for the next connection, or the registration system for a hotel where I have to enter my registration number and my, to fill in my name, and then after five minutes I'm done, and then I don't have to use it anymore. With my phone, I use it more often. So there's a difference what kind of quality you need on, on, on these different devices. So, now I mentioned virtual keyboards quite often already because it's what people usually start to notice first. Or whenever it, it comes to this topic, when I try to explain, yeah, we do text input for, 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 for handsets. Oh, virtual keyboards, right? Yes. It's actually um, only one part of it. It's just, it's prominent. Everyone talks about it in the back, or everyone sees it at least. But, Really, it's important to see it as only one part. 
you can still have puppy keywords on your mobile devices. Um, it's actually, I, I, it's probably going to be a, um, a target group that might grow on the open exist. They, they people actually really want puppy keywords on, on, their, on their phones. So, you have this group of textbook devices, which you can, which you can distinguish between Hard keyword, you can then have a virtual keyword, they have a keyword, of course, or you have both of the device, also works. And what's upcoming currently, or it's been upcoming for quite a while actually, um, is to use your voice as a text input system. With, with that, with voice, but there aren't many good, or at least as, as I know, um, open source libraries that can do voice recognition or or voice to text. So the easiest currently is still to just use, uh, for example, the, the Google API for that, which of course then you have um, latency through the internet. And these Google services don't always play nice with you. You get, you get different quality depending on time play or whatever. So what I tried to prototype with that, it wasn't very, very reliable. So I don't know whether we could have good um, voice text input or good um, voice to text support, the to text support in open, in open source platforms for, for the upcoming years or whatever. Because I, I can't see any activity there. Okay. So the other part, uh, if you have, if you have um, these text input devices, then the other part of that is um, of mobile text input is the text editing itself. So you have <coughs> things like um, color positioning there, of course. I mean, you, you don't just want to write text and then it's finished, not just read only and just depend. You often want to um, <coughs> go back and a text, pick something, delete a word, pick some spelling mistakes maybe or copy paste the code sections from some other application and keep into this specific place here. If you might want to actually do, um, you might actually want to write uh, larger documents on your on your tablet. I don't even ever do that on your phone, but some people really like writing emails with these devices. Then it can be helpful. Um, I consider that more of a gimmick, but there's also, of course, which text then where you can at least change the font size or change the color or whatever. Um, on, 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 on desktop, it's quite easy to do that. And on, on, the, on, the, on the enhancer, it requires quite some effort to think how you can do that. And then I was always thinking, well, there's a gimmick. I don't use that, so why do we just spend time on that? But probably because it appears to the users that it looks fancy, you can play around with that. And some might actually find it useful. So, so the definition for mobile text input then we can summarize it maybe as the traditional text input methods plus mobile devices basically, which makes the problem a bit, or the scope of the problem um, quite large. Okay. So this was, for example, the Registration system in the mobile. What you can what you can see on this on this on this screenshot mm -hmm. is that it's actually localized. So I selected my language and I I want to do the registration. I can maybe recognize that it's a supposedly a German keyboard that allows me to have this accident characters to the far left to input them. Um, something else you'll notice is the, the visual appearance of that um, keyboard because it needs to appear to a large audience, to another audience that might not have been exposed to these smartphones as much as we did, or as much as we are. It looks very much like a, like a traditional hardware keyboard. The positioning of the keys, the arrow keys, the, the number block, everything is there. Oh, even though you can't even use it, there's no way that you will use pitch up, pitch down, or whatever in this UI. It we can set it because it's only quite a to input and your expression on them. So, what could have been done, for example, it's 
just copying, so I was just copying um, the uh, half the keyword one to one. As it is in CCI, you can have um, removed everything that is not provided in this one. So we would have a context sensitive keyword here, for example. Mm -hmm. Then users wouldn't have to try to them. They would see what they need to do. Wait for that until we press OK button to submit the, the text. 
detect. So that's already, in that sense, good because it removes uh, one of these context switches. So, the problem now, this problem is now starting. When you, when, you, when you think that this is a good idea, you have all kinds of problems starting with that. So, because now you work directly in this application, you, for example, have to think about cost visibility yeah, in, this, in this situation. Before, as a proxy widget, you could only be credited to curl as visible at any time. So, you would always at least see the, the current ending of text and value uh, insert text. Here, you can have that the text flows outside of, of the visible area, maybe because you brought up the virtual keyboard, which makes the screen a little smaller. Then, your curls are suddenly gone and you start typing and nothing happens. It's also bad that the cursor is somewhere hidden because of that. You start typing and then it jumps up and it just moves it there, everything, and all of a sudden because that's just confusing. So you need to find a way that you can ensure that the cursor will stay visible, anticipating the virtual keyword that will come up. But also, you probably want to, to animate that so that you don't have a sudden, just a sudden switch. You might want to, I mean, it's, it's quite important to give the user the, the hint, you are currently here, you are making here. Right? I'm going to make the cursor. If, um, yeah, if the user starts typing, he, wants, he doesn't want to be surprised by the text comes up. So, you have, you have, cursor visibility as um, one problem. You, that you need to solve here. You have, so you have another problem that you want to edit the text again that you submitted here. So it, it needs to be possible to interact with that. Again, on the desktop, that's easy. Yeah, you have the mouse, and you can freely position the, the text cursor and any, edit, uh, any text entry that you can edit. And here, first again, uh, you have some problems that you would have to make that accurate, this positioning. You need to make, make sure that you can actually activate the whole text again to make it eligible again. This is not as trivial um, if you use um, the end of method APIs of the current toolkit. For example, we have to we have to hack quite a bit with, with the, with the pre-end handling. So, so the pre-end is the text that might end up with the application at some point. This is a definition that comes from XIM. Um, it's quite old already, it's a good idea. So, when you already edit something, and then you, you want to submit that, but then you want to go back to that and edit it again. You have to send it all the way back again to get the benefit and make it um, market as effective again. Which seems trivial and easy for, for Western languages, but then if you go to, 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 to non non Western languages, to um, compose languages, or that language that use compose characters, and the severe injection of getting it all the way back can be quite problematic because how much experience do you actually need? If, if it was composed of, um, of maybe three characters, then how do we do that? How do we know exactly where we have to move? Um, how could we um, reverse the composition of the character that we can bring the implementer back to the state where you can edit this composed character? So this is simply not trivial. Um, so what, what often happens is we delete the whole word or we delete the whole symbol and then use has to um, input again. That's not what you want. You want to be able, to, just as you have the investment language where you can put um, the cursor just between the characters, you want to have a composed language as well. You want to be able to actually fix small mistakes without having to delete everything. So then it's complex because you have to restore the state that you have when you were editing the cursor um, basically. So, about cursor positioning, I mentioned that already. On the desktop, it's easy. You just click and point, and that's it. If you if you're on a if you're on a touch screen, you've got to be on some. Some usually is covering the area that you want to hit. And most people, if you have a cast of touch screen, which uh, responds to your um, to that area of your finger, which is the top of your thumb, not to your finger there, you have the spires that you 
the way you can get it, the two touch is completely different area. So the the um, what the what the device gets, mm -hmm. it gets um, it gets a position that is some things that also below what you think it was. So and this actually you can't just add, use this offset and, and add that again because it happens on how you want to finger. If I if I use my device with uh, two hands, then my, my thumbs are probably like that. And then it's a vertical offset. If I have one hand use it, use it like that. Then it's a horizontal offset suddenly. So this can change depending on how I use the device. And you actually you would actually need to find out, uh, you would actually need to have a user profile that you can um, over time track the SS files and and just um, Adjust that for, 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 the, for the user. What we did in the end was on this device we, we just said, but you might not get it accurate in landscape on this uh, two hand finger usage. Or if you try to do both, we, we, we might. So if you try with two fingers, you might not be able to optimize that. We, we, we will try to optimize the other use case, maybe one hand use case. So we simply find a problem there, and then we can suddenly um, work with this uh, vertex again. Here, for the color positioning, what we did was to, to have a magnifier that appears when you press the text a bit longer, and you keep, keep it hold, uh, you touch the hold with the finger there, and um, the magnifying glass will appear, and you can actually then really move um, the color around with you. The nice thing is because you see the color the magnifier, it actually gets this accurate positioning feeling again the less now. Of course not as fast. You actually I mean you have to touch the press, you also need to wait for that, then you can move around. The point is at least you can then um, live it accurately. You're not relying anymore on on the accuracy of yourself. Um, The next one that we have, um, the, the next concept that we have, that we copy is from the desktop, would be text, re text, re text selection and formatting. So, as I already mentioned, being able to select text is, can be important if you want to copy and paste it to another application. It can also be nice if you are able to format the text, then, um, so the styling or whatever. Sometimes you just want to remove a whole section, or you might want to reorder the text flow. Again, on the, on the desktop, this problem seems to be solved. We, we can just, with one interaction, we can you point to the mouse, you, you, and then you drag, and you have the whole text selected, they, they then release the mouse pointer and the mouse button again. And then you, you use probably the hardware keyboard to just control C, control V, to copy and paste it somewhere. So this interaction is a fast and if you only want to use your mouse, then you probably have, then you often have um, toolbar buttons in the applications, or you have a context menu, then it allows you to select the sections. Um, again, on the, um, on, the, on the mobile device, you have to right click, so easy, it's so easy way actually to have a context menu in order, the right click. The, the only full replacement we have is this um, long press. Why is it full replacement? Because it takes so, so much time. So what's the time of for long press? Is it half a half a second? Or should it be three three seconds? Or 120 seconds? Well, it actually depends on the user, and it actually also depends on your touch screen accuracy. Because what we need to add to that, it's not just you just don't have 500 milliseconds if you put that in some. In some File, you have you have so the, the, the time it takes um, that the touch gets registered and it gets propagated to the toolkit that you actually then have to event. This can easily be another 50 milliseconds or sometimes even more. If, for example, the graphics stacks updates the screen in the screen, then for 20 milliseconds or for 10 milliseconds, nothing will happen but um, display updates. And so your, your touch event will might only arrive in the next cycle. So there can be all kinds of delays to that. And if you then take this optimistic idea that you can just use long press uh, or, or context menu, and you start putting long press everywhere in your UI, everything responds to that. 
um, even at the very um, poor, he's a uh, very horrible guy actually, because he's been constantly annoyed by the differences in the case of the girl friend. Then, what do you do instead? Instead of having this context menu, you try to put everything into a toolbar. The toolbar is a known concept because it's actions that are always there. So, but, but now, you start to put all the, the, the um, actions that you have in context menu also into the toolbar. Then you can see that the toolbar will easily grow. And when I have stuff in there that are actually not required all the time, it's just a, just a, in a very um, specific situation, you might need to copy or paste all these uh, formatting buttons. But then now they'll be always there if you have this kind of toolbar. Uh, toolbar. Um, again, I think it may be screen space. But what I consider actually worse is that they confuse the user. Then you have to think again about, hmm, if the paste, uh, the clipboard is empty, should we carry out the paste button? Should we remove it? Or then if you put it there again, then some paste is available. So then you have to just, the item constantly change, which, which can be very irritating. So, the conclusion actually that you might want to arrive at, you remove the toolbar and you, <coughs> you try to, to make the best out of the context menu and the toolbar from the desktop. And what we have on the N9 is whenever you start to select text, you then realize, aha, this is now a text to action, which might require um, this text formatting or this copy and paste stuff. So we will then show a toolbar next to, the, to, to directly the application where the user has the text. So that is not triggered by, by long press. It's triggered by, uh, by the text to action itself. When text is selected, then it appears. And the same space, you can, you can then have some more buttons that switch between text formatting or copy and paste. So then you don't have this uh, huge toolbar at least. Um, the nice thing is that the uh, user can easily, easily dismiss that toolbar if it just selects or moves somewhere else. Then there's um, this extra UI uh, is gone. It doesn't uh, it can't use it any longer. And the other thing, of course, is because we have the toolbar on top of the virtual keyboard, we simply save space. So, the way how you would imagine a perfect virtual keyboard might be that just yeah, if you really want to have a hardware keyboard in the way, or you want to have all the features of a hardware keyboard and put it on the screen, that should be your virtual keyboard. If you think about that, why is that the perfect virtual keyboard? Um, but it has body touch. You might not be aware of that, but, or you might not uh, actively use the body touch capacities of your hardware keyboard because it doesn't make sense to press one of the keys at once. But you use it when you type quickly. What happens is when you type quickly is that you start pressing other keys while you haven't um, released your finger yet. But you already start on other keys. You have uh, certain expectations how these keys should be inserted. And, and that the order is dependent on how you press your keys. Now, if you think about the virtual key, what if you compare to that, then it's probably a better idea to, to always insert everything directly on when you when you press, because then it means you can't you can't correct uh, your your finger movement anymore. You check the item for example, it has this making file which allows you to touch, then correct the, the, the position, and then release the finger at, at the, over the right key, and it only then you will insert the key. So this body touch this would create um, a very simple problem. You, you, press these keys, and then suddenly the release order determines um, the insertion order instead of how it should be, the order how you press. So then your text suddenly gets swapped and the multi-touch feature alone then, if you have a naive instrumentation, would lead to, to, to less accuracy. Simply because the users would make more mistakes with that. So there's, there's a simple solution for that. What you can do here 
to get close to the Hubble cube again, because we know that inserting on, on the key press actually is the right mode, is that whenever you press another key and something else was still pulled down, you just remove that key and forget about it. So you, because you simply assume that this happened because the user wanted to type correctly, not because you wanted to press multiple keys, because that doesn't make sense. So you press one key, you press the next one, and you know, oh, okay, we can forget that one we committed. And then we can, for the second key, we can just normally insert it when we release it. And then we realize actually that's what these are about. The order of the characters does, that is not, uh, it's not um, changed. And yeah, he can actually type faster now. He doesn't have to wait that that he has released the thing that he has first before he can touch the next key. He can do that in a faster a faster way. Now the only problem that we make then is that is that this this detail is that you have to uh, work with your modifier keys. When you modifier keys there's not something permitted to so you have to you have to you have to treat them separately from your regular keys. Because it actually can make sense to keep press uh, to press the chip, keep it, hold, and then we have all the capital letters you insert them, release chip, and then of course it should go back to the so normal mode and stop inserting capital letters. So, so there the auto commit idea would work of course. So Here we began, um, yeah, again, there's a, there's a schema that shows that the insertion order can be different depending on how you press the keys or release the keys. So, well, what I would like to say in, in the end, um, in closing words, is um, we have a project behind that. Um, we actually, when we did that for, for for, the, for Nokia's Mayo Mico project, we started, uh, of course, with this with uh, most of the code family. Over time, we actually had to release most of it. And we even uh, created a new project outside of uh, Nokia for that. It's called Mali.org. Um, our mission really is uh, mobile text input. And um, we we try to work together with, um, with some popular apples, with the toolkits such as GK and, and Q, to try to get our ideas, our APIs, proposals, maybe into the toolkit, so that then we will need an additional framework on top. Um, Mind Ascent is a, is a cross platform framework for this uh, that strikes basically. The application and allows you to easily write plugins for all kinds of uh, input methods. One could be the virtual keyboard that we um, talked about. And we then have this framework, it, you, it is installed on, 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 on your platform, on this integrated platform. Nice thing about the API developers, they don't have to change anything. The code, they, can, they, they don't have to think about that, they can just use it, and because we use um, Already existing APIs, implemented APIs that are similar to the ones that accessibility uh, toolkits use. Uh, we, yeah, we, we don't need to change anything in the code for that to just work. And the, the, this framework then provides um, some additional API to do um, additional tasks for that you can override some keys and the plugins, or that you can create the size of the virtual keyboard and all that. Um, it's actually not as much API that we offer there for our framework application developers. Our mission is more than to, to make it easier for, for plugin developers to write the input methods. And then the whole idea of, of our framework is wherever we for the, the framework, we make our framework available to the new platform, that all the existing plugins that are already being written can run there again. Um, so yeah. If you want to know more about that, um, Wikipedia actually has a lot of documentation about that, the screenshots, and also points here to show the examples, and it shows the uh, intensity of the findings. So, our willingness and IoT channels for this. So, yeah.
questions? What do you think about uh, handwriting recognition with a stylus for text input? That depends on your that depends on your touch screen. If it's a capacitor, you would need a special stylus for that that emulates um, the capacitor um, well, the capacity of the finger, basically. Um, we have we have on the annoying lab handwriting presence, but but there we use it for 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 shining text input basically because it's a it's a, it's a stroke based um, um, handwriting recognition and then so just with a few strokes you can compose these characters which can be if you train can be faster than using the traditional um, train input methods. Um, if you want to think um, that this a bit further and want to make it possible for Western languages, then you would probably have um, a bigger device, a bigger form factor than your uh, handset. So on, a, on a tablet, for example, this could work quite well, where you are able to write the whole word in another way, and not write the word on the same place. Um, that doesn't work very well. So, um, this is actually possible, and running recognition. Yeah, we have a plugin for that. In the end, it will use the same um, um, API in our framework, at least, to, to, to talk to the application. Um, personally, I'm not sure that the handwriting recognition is faster than typing. So, so I know that most devices have that. It was quite popular some time ago. But yeah, it's possible. Yeah, so the question is the, about the importance of text prediction um, and on, on headsets. But usually for Western languages, you don't need much text prediction or error correction. So simply because the, the words are easy to type, you type them quickly, and you can delete them in their own. So the only feature that I see that's actually used is this regressive autocorrect where you write the word and um, mistakes, spelling mistakes are, are automatically fixed as soon as you hit space for the next word. You rarely use the word candidate from, from, these, from some menus or from the list there just because typing is so fast. Where you need um, word prediction, again, where you actually really need uh, all the infrastructure is for composed uh, <coughs> languages or for languages listing of composed characters. Because there, it takes a lot of time to actually compose each character, and then it's much, much faster to be able to just compose two or three, which is the beginning, and then have the full word already, and then you can that. So, word prediction, um, yes, it is useful, but it's not as useful for Western, language, Western languages as people might think. It's also not for non Western languages. Well, I, I, I don't need to start the discussion or whatever, but I mean, uh, that might be true perhaps for uh, English or other similar languages, but for Spanish and you know, other Latin languages, uh, where uh, a, a word changes just by changing an uh, X and a uh, diacritic on it, sometimes yes. that best correction is not enough. You have to have candidates, or even better, you should have a real prediction system where, where it, predicts the word that you will likely type uh, based on the text that you have yeah. put it before, based on the history. Um, yes. Luckily, uh, um, for, for, for this kind of um, simple word prediction, um, or word candidates, and of word candidates, um, there are luckily um, some source libraries that you can use. You can, you can reuse um, dictionaries, actually, that you have. Um, Organization libraries because you then just compare the, the, the prefix of what you've already typed and try to find something in that dictionary, then you can use that again. Or you have an already typed word with pre edit, you constantly send the pre edit to your spell checker and get the candidates back from that. So, the, luckily, we, we actually have that already, this, this library, they are available, quite some good ones already. And so, um, 
So yeah, it's actually um, easy to do in that sense, if you want that. I have the same problem as well as yours. And at any point, do you think about uh, uh, Chinese improved language? Yes. But actually, if you if you have CN9 and you and, 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 um, and you port it into the, in some Asian markets, um, you should actually have all the Chinese issue methods there. So you should have kanji and hand-to-hand um, -hand recognition and all that. So it is possible to fetch that and no. That for I don't know is that depends on your region basically, that's the problem. That's not my division. That's <laughs> Okay. Thanks.